five touchdown, running in the first place for number one. Harris drops back, fades to the left, pressure on, and he goes down. Ja'Garrett Davis gets home, and the all-black sideline explodes here in Hamilton. Caught the five, it went through Marcus Dale's hands, and Kyron Moore, the presence of mind to catch it and step out of bounds at the five with 20 seconds to go. Pressure loads it up, goes down the field, taking a shot into the end zone. He caught it. Touchdown, Tiger Town. Brandon Banks, how did he do it? It is the breakdown. Welcome to another week here on Canadian Football Perspective. First time I've talked to you this week because uh, I took Monday off because I acted as though a Victoria Day holiday meant that I didn't have to work. I guess when you have your own podcast thing going, you get to make your own rules when it comes to holidays. But happy to be back. And uh, just a quick chat this week with, as always, at DT on SC, Derek Taylor. You can find him on the sports cage on 620 CKRM. How's it going, DT? What's going on out there, man? Good. I got a lot of hockey out of my system on the on the show uh, on Tuesday. <laughs> I was very excited to be able to rant about Here's the reason the NHL sucks. Oh, so I was, yeah. I'm always happy to be able to give the NHL guff for doing things that make no sense. The CFL gets it, right? Hey, here's our star players. You know what we won't do? We won't let people hit them in the head and do illegal stuff to them because, man, Brandon Banks can do some great stuff when he gets the uh, the football. So you, let's not let people murder him before he gets the ball, the chance to do stuff. The it's... NHL, they don't care. It's funny because sometimes I'm watching old Grey Cups right now and I see something happen to a quarterback and I'm like, yo, I'm like, that's got to be a flag. I'm like, because I'm so uh, socialized at this point that any time that uh, there's a hit on, even it's crazy how fast it's changed, how much more we protect quarterbacks, specifically the players that matter the most, obviously on the football field to the value of the game, the money of the game, the importance of the game, the storylines of the on and on and on we go. And, uh, and I saw a clip, I was watching the 2012 Vanya this week, so not even professional football, okay? This is national championship game, and my buddy Kyle Quinlan, after he throws, Arnaud Gasconadon takes two full strides, lowers his helmet, and crosses the face mask of Quinlan, and his head snaps sideways, and there's, oh no, and there's no flag. And it wasn't me looking at it and being like, oh, my God, we would have won that venue. Well, kicked our ass. We did not deserve to win in 2012. So it was I was just watching it back to just be like, man, how did this game actually unfold? Because I haven't watched the game in a long time. And uh, and I saw that. And that's what made me think of the protecting of star players that you mentioned off the top here, because I go immediately. I'm like, there was no singular player more important to that game than that guy that just got hit in a way that if you do that to anybody. That's playing quarterback in 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, or 21. It's like, it's a big deal. And in that game, football still, even in 2012, hadn't really figured out, it seems, that you should be doing everything in your power to protect those players. So it's amazing how, again, I say how fast it's changed, but it has almost been a decade, I guess. Yeah, change isn't glacial at a glacial pace anymore, right? Like yeah. we were discussing it on the show last week. And the last real monstrous hit and fill in any blanks that I might miss here. But the last monstrous CFL hit I can really think of was Taylor Loeffler on BC's Manny Arsenault in the end zone. Oh yeah. It was was a real turning point of, Oh yeah, that's not, that's not cool anymore. So I don't remember these big explosive hits and honestly, as much as they were fun to see, ultimately the game's probably better for it. Yeah, yeah. And the player safety stuff, I think we have all... It's funny because I had a video game. I, I used to always talk about this with Kyle Mello when we were doing Hamilton Radio where we would get into talking about, you know, the violence of football and all the rest and things like you got jacked up and all the rest. I'm on Monday yeah. football and the, the, the glorification of the violence and the hits. And, and again, it's always going to be a physical game. We're just getting smarter about how to make it physical so that hopefully people can last longer in the game and have better lives after they're done playing. Which, again, is not sexy to some people, but if you are that section of the population, you likely drive a very large pickup truck and uh, have an Oilers decal in the back of your truck. And uh, so I look at that. That was an entire section of the population this week that I felt for. A guy who drives truck whose entire identity is Oilers hockey. I was like, whew, that's a rough one. Uh, but <laughs> but I, uh, I, I think when you see the way that the game has gone away from that glorification, I had this video game when I was a kid. So I've, I'm seven years old. And I get a PlayStation 1, which I'm super excited to tell my son by the time that he's a video game playing age and there's like the PS26 
uh, yeah. that I had PS one PlayStation one, the original, the OG, my parents got it for me for Christmas. One of the first games they got me because they knew I liked football. I hadn't played yet. I just like watching it on Sundays in the NFL uh, was NFL game day 98 and check out the NFL game day 98 intro uh, because the 30 second to a minute trailer or whatever they would play before you would start the game. Every single hit is a five game suspension. Every single hit. And I'm as, as a kid, I'm sitting there watching it and I'm going, yeah, oh, yeah. And they're just cutting back and forth, right? But it's kind of like an XFL type feel. It's like cheerleaders, concussion, cheerleaders, brain injury, cheerleader. And it was just in that intro, it's stunning to see how it's like, wow, the NFL signed off on that. And you come to realize how much things have changed. But again, to bring it full circle in the NHL, it's like they haven't really evolved and they've gone in waves as well of of protecting players and certain players and not other players and everybody being treated differently at different times as well yeah i, I was just watching this and i saw what looks like john taylor getting exploded <laughs> oh yeah some pittsburgh Steeler just i, I would have thought that was lawyer malloy but now oh, he's getting oh it's ben Coates just oh, yeah. gets eliminated with a headshot <laughs> like, oh, yeah, uh, that's, how, that's how we sold games back then but whenever it was 11 12 13 14 it's now different, and honestly, do you, do you enjoy football any less because you don't see guys getting obliterated? I was just thinking about it, and it, it, it honestly, I, I don't, I, I, in the grand scheme of things, I don't honestly notice it anymore. Yeah, yeah, and it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't appeal to me when I watch older games. When I see just, and again, I'm, I sound like such a soft ex quarterback here, but the gratuitous downhill, lower the crown of the helmet, and try to blow someone's face mask off. Now, when I see that, when I'm watching, because I love old football games, like I love 80s, 90s football, early 2000s. I love all that stuff, but I don't love it for the violence. I love it because it gives me this nostalgic feel of going back and watching a game and seeing names. And I was even laughing with you before we came on here, DT, because I said I watched the 2001 Grey Cup when I was working out today. And again, I say this, I feel like every podcast, but I throw a game on. And I usually have my headphones in and I just leave it on as kind of like background visual for when I'm in between, when I'm taking breaks and being lazy. And the thing that caught my eye with the 01 Grey Cup between Winnipeg and Calgary, beside Wade Miller being just a stud, uh, is that the shoulder pads, <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like the, the Nike Sharks and the, the tape around the ankles and the, the old style jerseys and they're made by Puma and the face masks are so 2000s like late 90s early 2000s and the style of play and like everybody that's running out of the tunnel looks like a Madden create a player that was in the early 2000s it's just it's so typical and I love watching those old games for that I don't watch them to watch somebody get destroyed like we say so when I it's actually off-putting to me now when I watch older games and I see that stuff happen and my first thought is always why why? What? Like, why was that status quo for so long? How did we allow yeah. that to just be normal for so long and for so many people to pay the price? And again, there's a section of the population right now listening to this being like, wow, you're soft as hell. You know, that football is always going to be violent. Yeah, but you can control the stuff that you have to expose the violence to. Like, it's yeah. always going to be physical, but it's the idea of limiting the unnecessary stuff in order to maintain what still creates football because football needs some of that physicality. We don't want it to be flag football. Like I don't want to go out and watch seven on seven guys running around and pulling each other's flags out. I want to watch hitting, but I want to watch smart hitting. And that's the difference. And the CFL honestly is a special teams and everything else. They've done a really good job of, of being able to tweak rules and standards. I think to get players into better positions with that being said, there's still guys I know in the CFL right now who take painkillers after games, like more than they probably should. Honestly, when I talk to them, I'm just like, man, that's not good. I know how that ends up and how your body feels when you're done all of this. So th the side effects, I think, still exist, even with trying to protect players of the modern game, which should tell you how bad that was back when I'm watching it in the 90s and 2000s. <laughs> oh, I, I suspect there are people out there who who feel like, oh, football's was destroyed when they got rid of the clothesline tackle. So, <laughs> and, and you think of how far we've come since then. Yeah. And I get it. And football was, it was super cool, you know, back in the, in high school football, giving a guy a concussion because he felt like felt huge, but we just, we know so much more now. And the true, what I truly uh, love about the game, you know, 
giant dancing bears and, and you know elite speeds guys on the outside and smart play and stuff like that. I, I love it, and we still get ultimately you still get three hundred pound guys pushing two hundred eighty pound guys around the field sometimes too. But yeah. it just doesn't have to come with all the all the other stuff. And the CFL gets it, and the NFL gets it, and yeah, we're going to free this up and we're going to make the game better. And the NHL just absolutely does not. <laughs> and bless your heart, that's that's your all's choice. But I feel like people would like to see Connor McDavid doing amazing things, like how the NBA lets LeBron James do those kind of things. Par for the course, I think, in the last year and a bit was the NHL not really uh, figuring it out like some other leagues have. Uh, but that's a different story for a different day. Uh, yeah. We do want to remind you today, as always, uh, that the podcast here on CFP is brought to you by Fox 40, the worldwide leaders in whistle technology. For 15% off all your return to play whistle needs, you can visit fox40shop.com and enter the code CFP15. Uh, let's get into... Uh, just a couple of quick notes here. There's not much news this week. There's not much for us to break down, throw around. Uh, no big numbers stuff. No big uh, fantasy creator rosters. I just wanted to bring up some of the stuff that I had uh, worked on this past week because uh, mm-hmm. self-indulgent. And uh, the thing that I really wanted to to talk about was last week we kind of teased some of the numbers of Ron Lancaster and Russ Jackson and finished the article, put it up on CFL.ca. If you want to check it out, uh, it is available up there. And it was it was actually really eye-opening, DT, because as I'm watching the game and I'm breaking it down, and I, again, I haven't gone through all of Ron, Lan- Ron Lancaster's uh, Grey Cups as of yet. I haven't gone through 67. I still got to get to the 70s. So I just watched Russ Jackson's. But, of course, in two of the four Russ Jackson Grey Cups, it's Russ versus Ron, and which <laughs> makes me think of like going into the playoffs with Russ versus Rest. Uh, but Russ versus Ron uh, is it's special. It really, really is. And I came out of that thinking, well, Russ threw it so much deeper than Ron did. And there's no way that Ron, and then I actually crunched the numbers on it. And I'm like, wow, Ron Lancaster threw more vertically than Russ Jackson did. And Russ threw vertically more than anybody in the league at that time. So, and they were on the same team in 1960, which blows my mind because I got to pull this up here and get the actual numbers correct. But when they were in that 1960 gray cup, I think Russ Jackson took 54 of the snaps at quarterback. Ron Lancaster took 12. So they started Russ. They played Russ the majority of the game, but Ron Lancaster did get some snaps in that game. Uh, But as I I looked at the actual run pass play call percentages here in that 1960 Grey Cup, they've got those two guys that go on to chuck the ball downfield on like anybody has in a long, long time. And what do they decide to do with it at that point? Uh, they decided to throw the ball on 25.9% of their plays. <laughs> so they were going three to one run to pass with Russ Jackson and Ron Lancaster, albeit relatively young, figuring it out, getting into the game and all the rest. They developed into something very special, but it's pretty crazy to think that those two guys are on a roster and you're like, you know what? Let's take the ball out of their hands 75% of the time. That's That was football. Right. Yeah. Like for for how long and we talked about how things have changed rules wise in, in our lifetimes, our approach to efficiency of offense has changed so dramatically. Right. It, as it changes through every level of football. Yeah. Right? High school man running backs are the king man yeah. in the in the 80s and 90s running backs were the king. And now it's just it's just so much easier to get from A to B and it's so much more efficient to get it. In, in the past game, the, the article you have on CFL.ca, I, I was surprised to see the number of, because you have it charted on, on the field and where all these targets are. Yeah. Uh, I was surprised to see, one, the number of, of deep shots that they, that they took, and, and two, uh, there were a lot of incompletions in there, so they weren't particularly, it looks like, successful at it. No, yeah, and Russ was, this is actually my favorite side of the whole thing, which I'll get to in a second, but the, the pass uh, play call percentage, as I say, was 25.9% in 1960. Then I thought it was interesting because as I'm watching, I'm like, it's obvious that they gave more trust to Russ and called more passing plays in Ottawa. In 1966, it was 42%. In 1968, it went up 2% to 44%. And in 1969, his final game, it went up another 2% to 46%. So he went from 25%. And then Frank Clare was like 42, 44, 46. So if Russ would have played another 20 years, maybe he would have been 100% pass because it was this incremental increase that didn't seem like it was slowing down anytime soon. But um, to your point about the deep ball and specifically the extreme deep balls, 
Mm-hmm. That that was why I thought that Russ was throwing so much deeper for an average depth of target than Ron Lancaster. Uh, in three of the four Grey Cups that Russ played in, he had a deeper average target. The only time that somebody threw deeper than him was Ron Lancaster in 1969. And mm-hmm. it was sizable as well. It was like 18.1 yards for Ron and 11 point something for Russ. So when I, I looked at this, though, you see on the chart all those deep shots. And again, to your point, it's amazing because immediately when I looked at it, I went, wow, yeah, there's a lot of really deep stuff there. And then I went, wait a minute, balls thrown beyond 30 yards down the field. I've got three touchdowns, yeah. but outside of those three touchdowns, I've got one interception, but more importantly, I've got like nine, incom- eight, nine incompletions in there beyond 30 <laughs> yards down the field. And so, yeah, it was super inefficient. And even today, if you're hitting on 25% of your deep shots, 30, 35 yards plus, that's really good. But for them to be at that clip, but cashing in with touchdowns every time they take the shot, I'm like, no wonder they were throwing it deep because they yeah. knew that's kind of like the NBA three-pointer now. The more we take of this, we're not going to cash in all the time, but when we do, it's going to be worth more. And it's very clear that that was built into their their kind of uh, philosophy by the time that Russ was calling it quits towards the end of the 60s. But I wanted your thoughts on this stat, DT, because this is a, a bit of a one that you got to follow along with. But I... I felt like as I was cooking this up that I just wanted to talk with you about it, okay? Okay. Uh, My favorite stat I wrote in the article really separates Russ in the extreme deep ball category. From 1954 to 1969, which is just the great cups I've been able to get through, there were 13 quarterbacks who attempted at least 10 passes in great cups. Of those 13 qualified passers, there were 607 throws, of which... Of those 607 throws, only 15 of those throws traveled 45 yards or more in the air. Russ Jackson has seven of those 15. (laughs) So you look at it, it's like 13 quarterbacks are qualified, 600 throws, 15 of them went 45 yards or more, and Russ has half of them. And then the only people that have more than one or zero is Ken Plain and Ron Lancaster, and they both have two. So, wow. again, you, you just think about being a CFL fan at that time and what Russ Jackson would have meant to you as a fan because you were going from the stone ages of Raleigh Miles and Jackie Parker and Edmonton and Normie Kwong and running the ball over and over and over and over. And then all of a sudden there's this dude who's throwing it 45 yards down the field more than anybody you've ever seen before. And very quickly <laughs> as I'm watching these games back, I started to realize – okay, this is more than just the romanticism of the Canadian quarterback. This is, if I'm going to a CFL game, I'm watching someone do something that isn't being done and never has been done before. Like, imagine right now some rookie quarterback shows up in the CFL and starts throwing it 60 yards down the field three times more than any other quarterback in the league and having some success with it. Like, wouldn't our minds be blown by that? Oh, it'd be incredible. It'd be incredible. I was just looking at the best deep ball rates from this past season. Uh, two guys are over 10%, 30 plus yards downfield for their attempts. Mike Riley, not surprising. Yeah. James Franklin at 12%, but he didn't have a, a whole bunch of them. Uh, guys weren't, weren't that successful. And you, you uh, as I look at the Russ Jackson one, what is it? Three of 13 with a pick, but three touchdowns. Yeah. Uh, that rate of touchdowns is actually really good. Yeah. Like you, you don't get the other ones that, that are completed. Sure, fine. But if, if your goal is touchdown, like the top touchdown rate on 20-plus yard balls was Matt Nichols at 23%. Russ was far, far above that. The average <laughs> league average is about one in every eight deep balls goes for a touchdown. And Russ was <laughs> cooking three of 13. I, uh, I, I, would, I, I wonder. I'd love to give Russ credit for being the uh, the first sports analytics guy who figured out that the deep ball was worth more, you know, like the home run hitters and all the strikeouts in baseball we get now and all the three point yeah. shots. And we've gone to just these extreme levels in a lot of sports now for value because analytics is playing in. And and I it's kind of funny looking back at Russ and being like, I mean, I don't think he had the numbers on that, like expected value on targets of certain depth. Yeah. I just think he likes slinging it. right? <laughs> but he was ahead of his time, which, again, plays into the fan experience. Obviously, that's why people fell in love with him. The Canadian quarterback romanticism fell in love with it. But 
he was producing on those deep balls, even though he was inefficient, relatively inefficient, he was still producing in ways that you just hadn't seen before. So uh, it was a fun one to put together. It took some time. It was, it was tough to write because there is so much information that you feel like you're just not doing it justice whatsoever when you're trying to encapsulate the career of a legend in 700 words with a couple of graphs, but uh, but try my best. So hopefully people enjoy that again up on cfl.ca. And uh, my, my last thing on it here was uh, <laughs> I just I, I laughed at this, too, because you put together the skill target, the kind of the skill efficiency for targets and and how much they produced when they got targeted. And based on longevity with the team, it was actually Western Mustangs grad Whit Tucker. Uh, who led the way for Jackson in Grey Cup targets over names like Margene Adkins and Ron Stewart, which the Ron Stewart one I thought was funny. Uh, also, if you want to have a laugh, yeah. go to the go to the Ron Stewart Wikipedia page because it's uh, it took me on a journey I did not expect in terms of uh, collusion and government things and uh, expensing Ooh. trips expensing trips to Grey Cups that uh, you definitely weren't there. He was an ombudsman for the Correctional Department of Canada or something like that, and he was apparently. Uh, <laughs> charged in turn i don't want to get this wrong but he was charged internally with trying to uh embezzle funds in a couple of different ways and stuff and i was like whoa ronnie i did not expect that one but uh but yeah the Whit tucker number that i had for you here he was throwing 15 balls over jackson's four gray cup games he only caught five of them for a completion rate of 33.3 percent but two of his five catches resulted in touchdowns in the 1966 Classic against Saskatchewan. There's also one of the worst drops I have ever seen by a rider in that 1966 Grey Cup that no. if it's completed, I'm not sure that Ron Lancaster doesn't beat Russ in 1966. And then the narrative is completely different because if you end up having him 66 and 67 for the riders there, and man, that, that would have been... I got to send you this clip. I'll throw it in the YouTube version of the video here as well because it my jaw dropped it's like midway through the third quarter in a one score game and it's a bomb 50 plus from Ron Lancaster that drops perfectly over a defender's hand on the run and is dropped uh and it's it hurts I think it's Alan wow. Ford if I'm not mistaken who was the receiver who dropped it sorry uh, Alan Ford and friends and family but so it, it, like it, it was like Mike Jones in the 19 gray cup but but like twice as bad? Yeah, it was – honestly, it was uh, – Don Southern was the defensive back for Ottawa, uh, and he's running backwards, and uh, Southern couldn't really get off the ground uh, even at that point. So he didn't uh, really clear that much air, but he, he outstretched his hand, and Alan Ford's underneath it, and he tries to bucket catch it as he's running, and it oh. hits both hands square in the end zone and just falls to the turf, and you can hear – it's pretty rare for an announcer to get emotionally involved, but that was that was one where there was a, an emotional involvement there where the announcers are like, and it's oh, no. you can just hear them kind of <laughs> under their breath, like the same thing you and I do when we're calling games. And I, even if we don't yeah. verbalize it, that's what's happening in your soul and in your head is just going, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nowadays, it's uh, got to watch it in your hands. I, yeah. <laughs> I wonder what it was like in the time before instant replay. So yeah, oh. that's uh, yeah. that's. Tape That's don't so lie, my man. Yeah, for sure. We that I mean that'll be an interesting conversation we have one day about uh, the deep ball versus the intermediate passes because I have all the numbers on completion rates for thirty-five zones across the field and is yeah. what's the payoff versus what's the price you pay when it does fall because it falls incomplete seventy percent of the time. Yeah, how it's how it plays in the modern game because I I'm fully in favor of I would love more deep balls in the current CFL. I would just yeah the, the payoff that the, the Eight, 18% touchdown rate and the 25 yards per attempt is uh, a real nice plus. Plus the fans love it. So bring yeah. it on. Thinking yeah. about the fans. That's what we do here. Absolutely. And I'll also say this, like when I grade things out with the production grade that I use, um, I found it really interesting. You talk about the 35 zones and we can discuss this obviously much deeper as we get closer to the season. And I mean, we can honestly do a whole episode on kind of like best value for where you throw the football on a CFL field. And mm. I was I was amazed when I put this together. I basically did an article on CFL.ca. I think it was the middle of 2020. It might have been the spring, actually, before the pandemic hit. But And it was, where is the smartest place to throw the football based on the value that you're getting for production? 
and who is doing that more than anybody else? Like who's going to the spot? And it was a bit arbitrary because, you know, I chop it up into five zones wide. I go from the numbers out to the sideline, numbers to the hash, and then in between the hash, right? So, and I'm looking at behind the line of scrimmage and then zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. And so the, the zone for me that was the highest production was from the left hash to the left numbers between 10 and 20 yards. That was the spot that I, I graded and I just thought to myself, yeah, okay, so, so let me look at this tangibly of why 10 to 20 yards outside the left hash to the, the left numbers. Why would that be the spot? And I started to think about route progressions. How many times on second and long do you see a right-handed quarterback take a snap, look to the right-hand side, front side, he's reading out a route, maybe he's checking whether it's man or zone, whatever, flip the head to the backside, and there's a curl route in behind coverage with a drag underneath it, or there's an in-breaking route from a wide receiver into the boundary. And that throw where eyes are to the right, flip the hips and the shoulders back to the left, ball comes out, boom, in between zone coverage between the middle linebacker and the wheel linebacker in front of the half, in front of the free safety. And I went, man, that that's the highest production place to throw the ball on the field. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to throw to that spot every single time because you're always going to have the highest production. It was just for where people throw the ball in a CFL field, that spot yeah. and that type of throw is the most productive one to move you down the field and get you in the end zone, which I thought was intriguing. Yeah, you break yours down like strictly left, right, right? Whereas I will do boundary field yes. simply and, and then flip it across. So mine shows much the same. Again, it's it's numbers to hash mark but on the boundary side. And you go, oh, is that because that's where they put – elite receivers or is that because that there's something about that spot and the route combinations you run with that guy that are that are more effective but like you say in that uh, that what between 10 and 20 yards for me in that boundary slot it's so much it pays off so much more than than anywhere else the the middle is also very nice but that boundary slot is the place to be uh, I forget. I should actually pull it up here while we're talking, just because I'd love to give a shout out to the absolute worst place in the football field to throw if you're looking for actual production. Uh, because I do feel uh, like it, it, obviously the side deep... wide line of scrimmage behind. <laughs> any, any, honestly, anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Field side, anything under 10, well, under five yards to the field side. Teams do not throw there, and when they do, they are terrible at it. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't have that one up in front of me, so I'll have to save that for a different day, I think. But even, yeah. like, throwing to the sticks, like, I threw together an article on that one that I had forgotten I had even done a couple of years ago. But uh, throwing to the sticks, the production grade, the, the number of times that people do not throw to the sticks, yards in yeah. air, when it is second down and X, to be able to get a first down and people, man, they, we love throwing short of the sticks in the CFL, man. And, and the people that do throw to the actual sticks, they typically get rewarded. Like that ends up being something. So uh, the, the quarterbacks with the minimum 150 pass attempts from 2019 on second and seven to 10 yards. Okay. Uh, percentage of throws to the sticks. Number one, Vernon Adams Jr. Number two, Mike Riley. Number three, Bo Levi Mitchell. Number four, is Cody Fajardo of those yeah, uh, of those four people? Cody Fajardo had a way better production grade when actually throwing to the sticks, like e- exceptional. I think he was uh, for my money third highest production grade behind Masoli and Arbuckle. But that's because Arbuckle was getting second and seven and not barely ever throwing to the sticks. Like he's getting high mm-hmm. production grades, but he wasn't throwing it beyond the actual mark. Do you, uh, do your numbers also have the Winnipeg quarterbacks at the very bottom of that for some reason? I don't know why it is. I have, Winnipeg. I have Jennings as dead last throwing to the sticks. Uh, and then I yeah. have Strevler and Nichols as uh, second lowest yeah. and third low. So yeah, they did not throw to the sticks, but their production grade when they actually did throw to the sticks was equivalent to almost identically uh, Logan Kilgore and Trevor Harris. So that's yeah. a lot of guys that were throwing a lot of short passes and getting a lot of similar production out of it. And, and that will write this one down too. That makes me wonder, I'd want to dive into that and go, are they throwing it to the running back on second down a lot? Yes. And is that what leads to that? And it, what's the value of throwing to the running back versus in a situation? What's the value of designing a pass to go to the running back versus 
to an actual receiver. There's another half hour we could do another day. I'm writing, I'm writing that down. There you go. Good. I'm glad we got it. Uh, let's wrap up this uh, edition of the breakdown by just talking for a minute here about uh, John Mechie winning the Cornish Trophy. Congratulations to him. Uh, it's crazy. Like he's he's up against all these guys that were just in the CFL and the NFL draft. Some of them are now NFL players, like Josh Palmer out of Tennessee and Eamon Ogbongamiga taken by the Calgary Stampeders, who actually had more first place votes than John Mechie did in the Cornish Trophy, which is awarded annually thanks to Jim Mullen and David Dubay out there in Western Canada with Crown. Uh, it is the uh, top NCAA football player from Canada. So it's always a fun discussion uh, for me because I love watching NCAA football. I watch it stress-free, casually, <laughs> Saturday nights. You know, I grab a beer and I hang out and I watch the game and have some fun. And I very rarely dive into anything that is serious study and, and meaningful subject matter. But, man, watching Alabama and the way that they played with a, a Brampton, Ontario kid starring at receiver was so much fun this past year. So in the vote for it, I did put Mechie as my top. And uh, I put him there because I just thought if we're voting for the best player that's Canadian in NCAA football, nobody to me meant more stepping in, obviously, the injury to Jalen Waddle with his ankle this year for Alabama then John Mechie. And when I talked to Seth Galina, who's the host of the Pro Football Focus College Football Podcast uh, earlier today, actually, he basically said to me, like, this guy is not as fast as Devonta Smith. He's not as elusive as Jalen Waddle. He's not a jumper like Julio Jones. He's not, but he does everything well. And that's what's mm-hmm. going to be the key to his success going forward here is he's going to be probably a first round NFL draft pick. And he's going to be somebody, maybe even if it's in like the 15, 20, 25 range, he's going to get into a camp and a team is just going to look at his skill set and be like, there's no holes. And again, he's young. He still has so much room to grow, even in university, let alone getting to the pros and getting even more refined. Yeah. And he's not 167 pounds. No. (laughs) Alleviate some of the consternation, but six foot, 195. You're, you're going to prosper, right? If you played Alabama at this time in your life, you're going to prosper. But in the last two years, they've really shuffled some talent onto the NFL from Alabama at receiver. So now, man, it's, it's John Mechie's time, right? Coming mm-hmm. up in this 2021 season. So what do you do when you're not, you know, when you were the three, four option, five option the year before, because God, they were, they were just so, so ridiculously loaded but they'll need a new quarterback top two receivers go in the top 10 of the draft. Uh, It is a great opportunity for, for Mechie. It's, it's a shame that Chuba was uh, unable to, to follow up the incredible season he had winning the Cornish in 19, but that's, that's football, right? It's, it's great to see the Canadian talent at skill positions at elite schools in power five conferences making hay and going, yeah, Hey, that guy's one of us. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, Nathan Rourke, Nathan Rourke, Chuba Hubbard, yeah. and now you've got John Mechie. And so, yeah, we've gone quarterback, quarterback, running back, and receiver. And you might say, well, that's just because of the sexy positions and everybody wants to vote for them. No, there's a reason why these guys have been voted as the Cornish Trophy Award winner. And it's because they have been the best at not just what they do, but the best amongst all the disciplines for Canadian players in the NCAA, which, like you say, is stunning considering yeah. the competition that they are going up against. Again, Eamon Obamamiga, he could have won it this year, and he would have been a, a, a very qualified winner. But to me, Matchy was the choice, man. And he is he's going to be fun to watch. CFL fans, I'm sorry, he's never going to play in this league. But that, oh. doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that you can't end up watching him in his season. Because what Seth said to me is, listen, he's the top dog on the best team. If you don't know about him now and you're a Canadian football fan, you should learn real quick because every time you turn on CBS at 4 p.m. throughout the entire fall, a Canadian has the potential to be one of the best players on the field in the most competitive conference in college football. And yeah, the the idea of him going to the NFL, making Brampton proud and having a well-rounded game that sustains makes him lots of money, but also is it's, it's a pride factor for a lot of people that have been in and around his development. So we're all pulling for him. I think it's going to be fantastic to watch where he goes from here. Little Alabama Clemson in the play, in the college football playoff, maybe yes. little John Mechie, a Joe, a Joe. Ah, uh, Jim, yes. Ma- Jim Mullen is just engorged <laughs> thinking about the possibilities in the final four of the college football playoff because I, 
there, there's no reason, and America's got it finally. I mean, these kids obviously go down to play high school ball there. Terrell Janet, who went to uh, who went to the Riders in the second round, these guys go down to play high school football, and they get into the American system. You go, yeah, yeah, they can they can do it too. They can yep. absolutely do it too, and it's going to be fantastic. I may actually. Yeah, I, I don't think I watch much college football for the playoff, but it, I mean, like you say, Alabama at the four Eastern window on a Saturday. Yep, I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. What's match you got for us? Or, uh, or the, God, who's next that we don't even really know about quite? Yeah, uh, that's the thing too. Is if you really study this stuff, like you know, some of the people at Canada Football Chat do, and obviously Jim knows them from the junior ranks. When they show up, they're not surprised. And even as much as I love trying to keep track of these guys, I lose track, and I get so excited when I see somebody pop up I don't know about. I'm like, hey, we got another one. And all of a sudden, I have a reason to watch that team or to watch that conference and find out how they're playing. But are you telling me you didn't watch BYU Coastal Carolina this year when they made up that game within four days of actually getting on the field? Uh, That was the best game of the year. It was... it was insane. It was honestly so much fun. And I was like, this is the this is the mayhem college football needs. Teams calling each other out like a wrestling match three yeah. days before the game happens. And then the game somehow is incredible because the teams yeah. were super talented. And they're like, we just want to scrap and fight for everything. we. And again, a Canadian on Coastal Carolina at linebacker. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of fun connections that I think people should appreciate. The fact that winning the Cornish Trophy really does mean something. Yeah, it's always going to offensive players, though, right? Like we can all just acknowledge that eventually. We're, <laughs> I don't know who who would they name the the best Canadian defensive player for mm. because you're going to you're going to need one of those after a little while. Yeah, and they're going to have to split it probably. Yeah, like there's the MVP of the league and there's top defensive player, right? Or, or in our case, MOP and top defensive player because we're always going to go offense, mm-hmm. yeah. but we're going to need to name one for a defensive player. Who goes down to the state? You know what? We'll we'll take Christian suggestions. Covington or yeah, mm-hmm. we'll take suggestions yeah. on Twitter at CF Perspective is where people can find us. And you let us know uh, who needs to be the name of the top NCAA defender of Canadian descent. Uh, that is the Javon uh, well, Holland. There you go. Done. <laughs> yeah, the give Holland it time. Trophy. We'll see. Yeah. That actually rolls off the tongue nicely. That'll be good. Uh, thank you as always to our friends at Sawdust City Brewing. They offer brewery fresh beer delivered directly to your door. You can visit their website at sawdustcitybeer.com. Shop the wide variety of brews and learn more. And of course, this May listeners are getting an exclusive promo code. Use CFP during checkout to receive free shipping on all orders over $100. Sounds like a great Father's Day present to me. Shipping is available to Ontario residents only. Must be of legal drinking age. DT, thank you, man. Hope you uh, have fun on Sports Cage for the rest of the week. Let people know what's coming up. Yeah, we're talking plenty of football. It'll be hockey. There'll be a lot of hockey. We'll be the aftermath of the Jets and Oilers as the, the Jets move on. Farhan Lalji on Wednesdays, Glenn Suter on Thursdays, the great Luke Mullinder on Fridays, uh, plus tribute to uh, an all-time rider, rider Hall of Famer, who is, who is struggling right now with dementia and his wife. There's a great cause that our station is in on in helping Jack Abinshawn, so we'll talk plenty yep. about that on Friday. Fantastic. All right, so people can find that again on 620 CKRM. For us the rest of the week, Connor Wade back with All Canadian coming up for you on thursday and of course myself and kyle mello will round down the week for you on friday we got a happy hour tasting of uh there's <laughs> we got a great beer this week the spring saison which i enjoyed during the nfl draft uh i first time i had it was the nfl draft this year i cracked it i poured it and i didn't realize until i was done it at the end of the first round which was like three and a half hours later i go i just had one beer for three and a half hours and I didn't even realize because I was enjoying sipping it so much. So uh, I got to talk to Sam Corbett, the brewmaster of Sawdust about that because I I had a fun experience my first time with that one. So we'll review that coming up for you this week and uh, more written stuff coming out as well for you on CFP later on throughout the week as well. Thanks so much for listening. We do appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the breakdown. Make sure you're following Derek Taylor at DT on SC. I am at TSN underscore Marsh. We're back next week with another edition right here on CFP of the Breakdown.